Hi everyone, welcome to part four of our discussions on time series forecasting. And in the last tutorial, we looked at how to do this time series forecasting using traditional method, which is ARIMA. Okay. Now in this tutorial, let's look at the traditional feed forward neural networks. I keep using the term traditional because neural networks, uh, I'm not talking about LSTMs in this example. I'm talking about the uh, feed forward neural networks that we have used for data analysis, for image classifications and other tasks in the past. This is not designed to look at historical data, meaning there is a reason why we call this feed forward. That means the information is going in the one direction, as you can see, in the forward direction from input towards the output. Now, how can we use this for time series? Well, if we do certain tricks, we can actually use this for time series because instead of providing X and Y values, think of it as uh, providing, of course, X and Y, but our X is three or five numbers previous to the Y value. So if I have a data point from today, what if I provide data point from yesterday and day before and the day before and day before as inputs and today as the output? And for the next data point, I'm going to provide day before yesterday and yesterday and today as input and tomorrow's value as output and run this in a running, you know, uh, moving up. And uh, if we reorder our data such a way, this can be very useful. If that doesn't make any sense, let's get into Python code and uh, start to make some sense out of it, okay? So the data set we are going to use is exactly the same one as last time, so you are all familiar with this, okay? Please watch the last couple of tutorials. This is the air passenger data set. And I'm going to import the traditional libraries, which is NumPy, PyPlot for plotting, reading, uh, well, I should have just, uh, well, you can just import import pandas as PD, but anyway, from pandas, I'm just uh, importing read CSV because that's the only thing we seem to be doing here. And uh, math, these are all traditional libraries that we're going to import, so hopefully no surprises there. Now, if you don't have a machine learning background, you should have it. Go ahead and watch my videos on the basics of machine learning to understand exactly what we are talking about. But until that point, let us uh, let me introduce you these uh, to these four methods that we are importing from some of these special libraries. For machine learning, deep learning, I recommend working with Keras if you are uh, a beginner in deep learning. Of course, there are many libraries. Keras is built on top of something called TensorFlow. And if you know what TensorFlow is, uh, Keras is a usable way of TensorFlow. Think of it that way. So within TensorFlow and models, we are going to import sequential because uh, in this case, we are going to define our model in a sequential way. Okay, first uh, a layer comes in and then another layer and then another layer, another layer. So sequential is a great way of actually defining this. If you have very weird architecture for your deep learning, then it can make things complicated. But in this case, this is simple. And also from keras.layers, we are going to import dense. Dense is this uh, 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 fully connected layer that we are actually talking about. The, the image you know, on my title slide is basically representing a dense layer, okay? Where every neuron is connected to every other neuron. So this is, uh, this is your actual neural network part. And then from scikit-learn, scikit-learn is another machine learning package that, that contains a lot of traditional machine learning tools, including classifiers like random forest and support vector machines and a whole bunch of other classifiers. But uh, also under pre-processing, it has uh, scaling tools like min-max scalar. I'll talk about why we need this in a minute. And of course, under metrics, let's just import mean squared error so we know we can calculate this mean squared error. Okay, so let's run these lines if we haven't already done so. Okay, it imported all of that into Python now. Let's go ahead and load our data frame and our data frame is again, we are doing pandas. So our data and air passengers.csv, I'm just using column one right there. So when we do that, our data frame looks like this. Okay, I'm not importing the date part, I'm just using uh, the column part, uh, the passengers part. So we can forecast it in future. Uh, because we were not doing with date plotting, uh, uh, other than plotting, we're not doing much with that anyway. 
Okay, so we imported that, and if you want, you can just go ahead and plot to have a quick look. We did this in the last couple of tutorials. You see how the number of passengers are trending upwards, meaning more people are actually traveling at the end of this 140 data points. Again, this is monthly data for 12 years, so 144 total data points there, okay? So by 1960, December, uh, uh, 600,000 people are traveling at the peak. Now, I think in a day you have that many people, well, not with coronavirus, but in general, you have a lot of uh, travel nowadays. Okay, now uh, let's actually convert this data set into NumPy arrays because when we are uh, dealing with uh, uh, deep learning in general, what we supply to it is a NumPy array. Okay, so let's convert our data frame values into a NumPy array. So immediately for data set, you should see that, okay, this is just a NumPy array. It may look like a data frame, but you see how it says integer 64 here instead of data frame. So that means we have 144 data points and one column. Okay, that's what that means. And they're all integers. Now, when we do some math with these numbers, especially using neural networks, we want these to be floating point numbers, not integers, because you don't want to lose things in round of errors. So that's what I'm trying to do here. So let's go ahead and, uh, uh, and uh, uh, convert them. Now, the value should remain exactly the same, but uh, now instead of integers, it's allocated more memory to make it into a floating point number. And you'll see that in a second. In fact, that, that step may have been uh, optional step because the next step will automatically do that job for us anyway. So uh, now let's actually apply this min-max scalar. Remember from scikit-learn tree processing, we are importing min-max scalar. So what it does is our numbers in this case are ranging from 112, you know, let's open this to 132, 140, uh, you know, 108. And if I go all the way down, it's like 400 and 300, which is okay. In this case, we only have one column. So this step is probably optional. But uh, uh, in general, certain type of activation functions like uh, neural networks actually uses activation functions like sigmoid or tanh or you know, other activation value and other activation functions. Uh, now, some functions are good with these type of numbers. Some functions are not good. They like values between zero and one or minus one and one. So let's just go ahead and bring all the values to between zero and one. So let's go ahead and do scalar equals min max scalar feature range zero to one. And now my data set, when I fit that to my data set, you should see that instead of values 112 and 400, it's going from 0 0.015 and everything. And if I go all the way down, there seems to be, you see the maximum value at position 138 equals to one. If I actually open the original data frame and let's actually look at 138 the maximum value is 622. As the name suggests, it's actually scaling values between minimum and maximum right here. That's all it's trying to do, okay? So my maximum is one, minimum is somewhere around zero something, and all the values are between zero to one. So we are good now. So this is all pre-processing when it comes to neural networks that you probably are used to if you have watched my previous tutorials. Okay, so now that the data set is ready, Let's split the data into training and testing data sets. Again, uh, if you ha are my regular viewer of my videos, you know what I'm talking about. We have to split the data into training and validation data sets. So we train uh, a model onto the training data set and fit it to the uh, validation data. Now, traditionally we take 20, 25%, 30% random data points, okay? Uh, for validation, but in this case, we cannot do that because time series by definition means time has some meaning. The series by definition means there is a uh, some sort of a meaning uh, for how, uh, you know, when they occur in this series. So you cannot just take certain elements out of this series. So the way we are splitting is, okay, the first two thirds of the data points are for training, the second uh, one third uh, the remaining one third is for testing. That's exactly what I'm trying to do here, okay? Multiplying by 0.66 or 0.67 to make this uh, training and testing is all uh, data minus this, okay? And then we are just going and uh, dividing this into train and test. So after this, we should see 95 data points for training and 49 data points for testing. That's it. All we have done is split this into two thirds and one thirds. 
Now, uh, again, I'm going to share this file with you, so don't bother reading all the text I have here. That's for you to read later on when I publish this, okay? Uh, it should be available, actually. Look at the GitHub uh, link in the description down below. Okay, so uh, if this is all the explanation about what I'm going to do down here. What I'm going to do down here is, if I look at my training data set, for example, train, it's just one column. How do I fit this to a neural network? Anytime you're fitting a model, you have input and output. With Arima, we only have one thing, and then we kind of fit that, uh, you know, uh, but when it comes to neural network, this is a different thought process. You have a bunch of inputs going in, and you expect a bunch of outputs or a single output, okay? So inputs and outputs. So we have to divide this data such a way that there is some input and there is some output. And the best way to do that is, just think about it, if you just take the first value, second, third, fourth, and fifth, the five data points as x, and then the sixth data point as y. For the next row, take these five, like starting with this, take one, two, three, four, five as the input, and this one as the output. And for the next one, this is the output and the previous ones are input. So we are moving it slowly. Uh, so this way we can say that, hey, this is a series. I have five data points as input, predict the sixth one, predict the next one. So that's exactly. So this is a way of teaching neural networks how the time series looks like. Okay, we are gonna do exactly the same even for LSTMs in the next tutorial. So that's exactly what we are doing. Uh, our X and Y start with the empty, uh, empty lists, and then we populate the list by just going through this, and then we define a window, and uh, window size can be like five, whatever the window size that you want, and uh, define the window size, and then uh, uh, window, and then just go ahead and keep adding these values with, that fall into this window to your X, and the value that's next to that to your Y. So. Let's go ahead and run these lines. Nothing will happen. This is just a function. Now let's uh, call that function. So for, for now, let's just put five time points, okay? And then create our training and testing. Apply this two sequences to our training data set with a sequence size of five, okay? I hope that makes sense to you guys. And let's go ahead and run these two lines, test X and test Y. And let's go ahead and open test X. So you can see exactly what we are talking about. And let me open our test test, or let's do train, okay? Train X, this is our original training, and this is our train X. Okay, now you see the first row right here? 0 0.15, 0 0.027, 0 0.15, 0 0.027, okay? Keep an eye there. 0.54.54, all of these, uh, all the way to 0 0.32, all the way to 0 0.32. I should also open train Y. There is my train Y. So what is the corresponding training value after, sorry, let me move up, after this 0 0.32, 0 0.0328, it's 0.0598. If you look at the original data, 0 0.0328, 0 0.0598, okay? I hope you guys are with me here. Now let's go ahead and move to the next one. The next one is nothing but instead of starting here, we are starting at the next point and then moving down five, all the way from 0.027 to 0 0.059. 0.059 was our y value before, now it's part of our x, which means the next value will be part of our y, 0 0.084, 0 0.084, there. Okay, so we do this for this entire data set. That's it. This is the trick. I guess you can switch off this video now, but uh, if you want to know more, continue. Okay, so I'm not going to print out the training part there. Now let's go ahead and build our model. This is very simple. I'm going to build a uh, model using sequential method in Keras. Remember, we imported this method. And then I'm going to define, again, how many dense layers. Again, this is, this is I almost said everyone's guess. Well, some people know which one works, which one doesn't work. But go ahead and start with single dense layer. Do not put too many dense layers. Uh, then your problem will be overfitting to your data, which means it works great on your data, but then any other data that looks like yours, but then with some variation, it doesn't work very well. In other words, if you have too many dense layers, too many hidden layers, 
then the data will be overfit to your training data. But when it comes to validation data, it doesn't do that well. OK, so that's why be careful. In fact, I almost recommend only using one single dense layer. So let's go ahead and do that. Only single dense layer of 64. And uh, input uh, dimension is our sequence size because we have five uh, in our X, right? I mean, our text X is one, two, three, four, five. That's our input dimension. And I'm going to use an activation of rectified linear unit. And then the last layer, the dense layer is the output, okay? We have only one output, which is the Y value, the next value, okay? And uh, it's going to look at, again, please watch my videos on deep learning. You'll understand what I'm talking about, mean squared error and all that stuff. So this is very straightforward. So let's go ahead and run these lines. So this is basically a model. We defined it. It says, okay, in the first hidden layer, we have 64 uh, of the dimension and it's going to calculate 384 parameters in that layer and 65 total 449 typically you have thousands if not millions when you're doing image processing uh, type of applications and even with some complex data you can end up with that type of data okay so uh, we'll do that and uh, let's go ahead and fit the model now let's do 100 epochs and let's put the verbos to two so we can see what's happening on the screen and we, it's going to use validation data, test X and test Y. If you remember, we split our data into training and testing. It's going to use the test X and test Y for validation. What does that mean? It checks these and then spits out an accuracy value every uh, after every epoch. So you'll see that on the screen any moment now. So there you go. It should be pretty fast. And you see the validation accuracy is 0.023. So that's very good accuracy, 2.3%. Let's see how, how uh, the output looks like. Uh, so let's go ahead and predict it, just like we have done in Arima in the last tutorial. Anytime you define a model, you fit it. Most of the time, you just take that model and then dot predict and supply what values on which you want to predict. So let's do prediction both on testing and training data set. So this is what we are doing here. Okay, we can open and have a look at it, but they don't mean anything. And uh, because we have done a transform here, remember uh, we did a, where did we do the transform? Uh, min max scalar right there, scalar.fit transform. Uh, if you actually look at the output, like train predict, train predict, the output is going to look like 0 0.05, 0 0.06 and all that. It doesn't give you an idea of how many passengers are actually traveling, which means we have to do inverse transform. And it's very simple scalar.inverse transform instead of transform. Again, let me go back up. Where did we do that? Um, there you go. So scalar.fit transform. Now we just need to do inverse transform. So makes sense, right? So we do that for both train predict, train y uh, uh, inverse, and then train predict, uh, sorry, train uh, and then uh, uh, testing data sets. So let's go ahead and do this. And now if I open train Y on test Y inverse, now it's actual numbers like 355, 422. So the numbers that we can understand, not 0, 0.0 some uh, values. Okay, now let's go ahead and calculate the root mean squared error between the, uh, between the two, between uh, the training uh, and the prediction on the training and between the testing data set and the prediction on testing, okay? Again, we expect that it does well on the training data set Okay, so our RMSE here is 23.86 for training, 57 for testing. Okay, that's not bad. How does it actually look like? Well, to do that, let's go ahead and do also the forecasting before we plot it. So, uh, uh, so all I'm trying to do here is remember everything is offset because we are actually moving things. So we have to go ahead and shift the predictions so that they align with our x-axis again. So we can kind of compare everything. Otherwise things are shifted a little bit. Study this part of the code again. This is very straightforward and simple. So study this part. All I'm trying to do is uh, uh, move offset these and finally I'm just plotting it. So let's go ahead and plot. Again, I'll share the code so you'll have enough time to go through this. This is not a great prediction. You see how this is not fitting things very well. It almost looks like it's offset a little bit. Now, is that real offset or uh, I think we are taking care of this here. In fact, I double checked the code here. So this must be something real. So let's go ahead and 
add this second dense layer. And now let's see how it actually works. So let's run the entire code again. It's reloading these modules for some reason. Okay, it's running through. Okay, so I guess it's not bad. I mean, very similar RMS scores, but uh, you can see how the result looks like. Okay, we'll compare this uh, uh, with our LSTM in the next tutorial, but uh, uh, there may be a shift error here. Maybe one thing need to be shifted to the left. Sorry about that. I should have checked this. Uh, well, I'm assuming that's the problem, but uh, we can go ahead and look at this, look at this part of the code. But you can see how the uh, forecasting can be uh, actually done in this case, okay? And you can also predict uh, uh, for future. You know, this is basically I'm predicting, I'm forecasting for the test uh, period, but you can also, uh, you know, uh, do the future, but that's not fun. Well, I said that's not fun because we don't know how accurate we are when we do that. Okay, so I hope you learned how to use neural networks to do these type of forecasting. And in the next tutorial, let's look at LSTMs. In fact, in the next tutorial, I'm going to provide a quick overview of LSTMs, and then let's look at LSTM in the video after that. Okay, so uh, thank you very much. Until then, uh, please go ahead and subscribe to my channel.